Hi, I'm Richard Lang and this is my friend Anne Seward. And uh, Anne has been involved with seeing for many, many years. And we're going to chat about her experience today. Hi there. So where did it begin, Anne? It's difficult, isn't it, to know, <clears throat> to know where um, one's spiritual journey starts. Um, but I think of it as uh, rather, in some ways, a negative sort of um, environment where my mother was um, somewhat neurotic and really ruled the roost by the emotional blackmail, perhaps one might say. Uh, at least that's how it felt. Mm -hmm. And um, I was brought up as an Anglican um, by both my parents. My father was the one who was spiritually, uh, more naturally spiritually... Um, Inclined? Yes, yes. Um, and my mother was driven by fear, I think, a lot. And so that one day when I was talking, we were, Dad and I were talking about evolution, she stormed in and um, blew her top and typically everyone just kept their heads down for the next three days, you know. So it was kind of, one was on tenterhooks as a child, especially in that area. And as for other religions, you, you know, just... Don't not because she had thought about these things, but she was just hanging on to straws, I think. Mm. And... Um, by the time I had um, children, I dropped out of the church. It didn't seem to be to be delivering what it was claiming to be about to me, which probably said more about me than the church. Mm. But that's how it seemed. And I had previously spent some time living with Quakers, and that was my first experience of another approach. And... Um, I started thinking about what was at the bottom of all religions. I'd heard this rumour at school when there was a f kind of fierce argument going on and someone threw in, oh, well, it's supposed to be the same thing at the bottom of all religions, isn't it? That caught your attention. It really caught my attention at, at about 12, that was. Um, and I thought, is it? Wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was the opposite <laughs> to what I'd ever been um, uh, indoctrinated in. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, really. And um, so that stayed with me as a kind of symbol of what I was missing, I suppose. And um, so um, I dropped out of the church, in partly in order to discover what was at the heart, what this rumour was about. Mm. Um, but not being academic, academic or having any real friends in spiritual things or knowing anything about it, any of that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't know where to start, really completely blank, but I was certainly open to searching what it was about in terms of all religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a very short time, I attended, I belonged to a discussion group, and um, within a very short time, they had someone called Douglas Harding to speak about meditation. It wasn't, this discussion group wasn't at all about spiritual things. It could be about anything, you see. Um, so I thought, oh, well, this would be interesting. See what, see what, med um, yes, what meditation is about, because mm. meditation in the East, in the Anglican church wasn't part of the scene, at least as far as I was concerned. And um, so what Douglas showed, um, or tried to convey, we didn't have any, he didn't have any kind of um, experiments established at that time he may have done some pointing I don't know um, was he, he told us what the people were trying to discover in meditation the silence the stillness within and this sort of thing and um, he said but do you essentially what he said was do you need to meditate in order to discover this can't you see that where you are is empty still quiet or silent Hmm. for the world to happen in. Hmm. I mean, that was the, the message, wasn't it? Hmm. And uh, call me naive, but... Uh, <laughs> um, but what really caught my attention was he had written, he said he'd written a book called Religions of the World, hmm. um, which, and this was around this um, uh, inner 
perception. So this was 1968, was it? Uh, uh, 60, yes, August 68. Yes, he just had that book published, yes. Yeah, and uh, it's a little slim book, so I went straight out and got it. And what's more, he was very local, he was only six miles away from him, me, and he had said he had open house for anyone who wanted to pursue this. And I remember at the meeting, as he went out of the door, he passed me and he said, don't neglect it. Don't neglect it, will you? So I'd obviously given an impression for a question I asked that I'd got it. I mean, I mm. didn't think I had. Mm. But I was certainly interested because of this religious uh, connection re mm. with religions of the world, you see. Mm. So I went out and got the book and read it uh, rapidly from cover to cover. And during this time, my mother came up uh, she lived a, quite a long way away, so we didn't see each other very often. And I found myself starting to explain to her what Douglas had showed me. I didn't think I got it, but mm. I started to explain to her. And within a few minutes, she'd got it. Absolutely. And it absolutely blew her top. I mean, she just... It was amazing how what difference that it made to her life. You. Um, and so this got me even more excited. Even though I didn't think I got it. I was one of those people. It does happen sometimes when you don't think you've got it, but you find yourself explaining it to someone else who does get it and tells you about <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> and um, so um, she said, come on, we must go and see this man. <laughs> well, in fact, there wasn't time then, so she had to go back. Um, but I went back after that, and I was, I was a yes butter. I took a long time to um, accept it. You know, under pressure, when Douglas would go like this and say, there's nothing there, is there nothing there? I would admit it. But, you know, it was always but something or other. But yes, but, you know. And, um, I often used to go there when there were lots of friends, kind of obviously um, high on this thing. And I couldn't help what, thinking that what I saw couldn't be it because it didn't make me high, you know. Mm. It's just so banal and nothing, nothing to it. <laughs> so what happened? So... Um, I was yes butting yet again, and Douglas said, well, there's some resist." He's just said very gently, well, there's some resistance there, there, there Anne. And I said, I was most indignant. I said, um, um, or at least I thought, no, no, I'm not resisting. I really want to see this. I really want to get this, you know. <laughs> um, and it was very shortly after that, maybe within a day or two, that I was just hanging out the washing. And I just noticed that between these two hands, there was no thing, no mm. head, no face, no brain, nothing except mm. the washing and the world, you know, the, mm. the sky and so on. So I just said to myself, OK, I see it. OK, I see it. Stop messing around, you know, I'll accept it. It was very low key. Mm. That, that's how it, mm. you know, big, then it had a chance to start sinking in. And how, I mean, that is 40-something uh, uh, years ago. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I know you, Anne, and I know that it's, it's central to your life mm. uh, s since then. Is that right? Would you put it Yes, like oh that? yes. I mean, to start with, um, uh, there, was, there were one or two rather extraordinary things, um, which... Probably I, I, I won't go into because that was peculiar to me. And, um, but some, Experiences. Yes, I mean, for instance, there was a, a lovely scent in the air all the time for about, um, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks or something. This gorgeous, this just faint scent. Mm. And apparently that does happen sometimes. Well, I didn't know that. Mm. And very striking, um, very strikingly, I had two babies at the time. Um, I suddenly had an hour and a half to spare at the end of every morning. And I suppose it was because everything was just getting done more easily and efficiently. And mm. But that was very striking, mm. I must say. Um, but that was peculiar to me. I mean, other people may not have, have any kind of um, mm. striking result. Um, and then gradually, I suppose... Well, I'll go on with um, how I got, um, became, as the children grew up, I became um, more available to do, um, to help Douglas with, um, particularly with proofreading and mm. um, 
um, secretarial things. And, um, and then soon after that, I started a journal for friends with the old Gestetner and stencils and <laughs> things like that. I suppose I did about, oh, I don't know, maybe eight of those. So you got involved in the work, so to speak, of sharing it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then we changed to a journal. Well, I changed to a journal, um, which I suppose it went out to about 300 people at that time. At least I pr had 300 printed, I think. And I did about six of those. And um, so I was very much... Um, uh, I was lucky in having a lot of support around. I mean, there were always people visiting Douglas, and he'd always ask me over. Mm. Um, and um, so one got a tremendous input, whereas my poor old mum went back, and she had no one to support her. Mm. And she'd left the church. She left the church as a result of that. Gosh. And I think she was bereft for the rest of her life, really. Yes, on you know, her own. It was own. a bit sad in a way. Yes. I mean, I did what I could, but I mm. didn't see her very often, mm. and we spoke over the phone and things. So you gained enormous support from having so friends. So I was very, very lucky. Mm. If you ask me what it's um, done in my life generally, I would say it's very difficult to pick out bits and say that was because of seeing. Mm. You can't really. Um, but I would say it, what it gave me access to was um, the heart of all religion, <laughs> which I suppose I thought originally was going to be some kind of statement, you know. <laughs> um, but in fact it was going to be about me which I didn't realise at all you see of course this is the heart of everything and that's what it gave me for the rest of my life a base a base of reality that is available anytime anywhere um, and nothing can ever happen to this nothing can ever uh, destroy it because it was never born I mean it was it's beyond life and death out of time so that must so, affect the way you are in in your life in the world yes well I guess so because this is this is my reference point always well when I say always I mean when it's not I'm, I'm suffering in some way probably mm -hmm. or overlooking it um, so I think above all that's what it gave me um, a solid base which is totally, totally reliable and is more real than, or being unchanging is, is precious for that reason mm. and, and gives one total, uh, a new sort of overall perspective on everything. If you come back here in relation to whatever's going on out there, it gives you a, um, a kind of purely objective God's eye view of things mm. and it only has to be for a moment to change how everything looks mm. you know from not doing that or from overlooking that and you're free essentially one is free of attachment to the world but then the, if the world comes in to the extent the world comes in and convinces you you're not free that's when you're not one's not um, living up to mm. The awareness of this. A very practical resource in your life. Extremely. And, uh, extremely. It, you, you I, couldn't, I couldn't overstate it. No. Yeah, it's just and everything. You, you discovered what you were looking for without really yes. knowing what you were looking for. <laughs> very much so, yes. I thought it was going to be something out there, you see. Yes. Something that I, I would know that um, it, uh, that was obviously symbolic, wasn't it, of yes. uh, what I needed to find in myself. Yes. Uh, so, yes. I think it's impossible to pick out bits, specific bits, and say mm. that was due to seeing. Mm. I can't do that. Mm. Uh, for a start, one tends to get taken away from it by um, a gradual process. You don't notice till you're caught in something. Right. And then you and think, then... ah, you know, I recognise the symptoms. <laughs> Must come back. Um... Must come back. Must wake up. Wake up, you know. It's... Well, thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. Okay. Huh. Thank you.